good. And so we've been going through uh, a, a series called uh, Old Time Religion, and uh, this morning we're going to wrap it up and uh, talk about one of my favorite aspects of church. And so um, I love church. I have, I've grown up in church. I've been in church my whole life. Um, my best friends are from church. Uh, most of my, my, my experiences are all from church. I, you know, I, I um. I grew up going to church. I serve in church. I, you know, I, I think I told you when I was when I was in uh, Ohio. When I grew up, I had keys to my home church when I was like when I was like 13, uh, because I was there that much. They just gave me keys, which is amazing because I can't think of a 13 year old that I would give keys to this building. Uh, there's some adults I wouldn't give keys to either. So that's not, it's not just because they're a teenager. But I, I was there, and, I, and I, all of my best relationships came from church. All my best relationships came from church. You know, as we're um, as we've gone through this series, we talked about, you know, the good old days where we, we remember how things used to be. And sometimes we get this bright image of how things, was always, things were always better uh, in the time before. But really, they, there might have been aspects that were better, but they're never as good as we remember. They, they weren't as good. It wasn't as good then as we think of it as now. But there are some wonderfully foundational things. But the danger in thinking back to how things used to be is that we can get stuck in that nostalgia trap thinking that uh, only old things are good, only the things that happened previously are good, and that the new stuff, it's just all the newfangled whatever, we, you know, it's new, whatever, whatever, whatever. and we get, we, we get stuck in thinking of the past, which prevents us from seeing what God desires for us in the future. The past should be the foundation that we build on. It should not be the anchor that holds us back. It should be something that we build upon and move forward through. Now, the other danger, the other trap that we, we've been talking about is the progress trap. And that progress trap is, um, is this, thinking that just because it was old, it should be thrown away. It's no good. It's not good. But some of the most foundational elements of my life, they, they, they are not new things. And some of the most, well, most, Christianity is not new. The Bible is not new. The most influential and impactful things in my life are ancient. So if we get in this mindset that old is, only old is good or only new is good, both of them are wrong. Now, does God want to do a new thing? Absolutely, he wants to do a new thing. But we need to build upon what has happened before. And that's kind of been the thrust and the focus of this series uh, as we've been talking about it. And so uh, today, we want to talk about my, some of my, my, my favorite things. Um, how many of you, I grew up in Royal Rangers, right? I grew up in Royal Rangers. And um, when I was in Royal Rangers, if you're not familiar with Royal Rangers, it's, a, it's like a scouting group for... Um, for, it is like a scouting group within the church. Now, uh, Royal Rangers, one of the things that they had us do was a compass course. And um, as God is my witness, if I had to navigate using a compass, I would never find anything. They, they had us take this compass course. And so they give you all the longitude and latitude. They give you all this stuff. And I don't know. Apparently, they thought we were Magellan. I don't know. But uh, I only, I ended up a mile and a half away from where I was supposed to be. And the first dead giveaway that I was in the wrong spot was that there was nobody else there. <laughs> right. Uh, There's nobody else there. And when I shouted out loud, and I can be loud, um, nobody responded. And so I was out in the middle of the woods by myself with no clue of how to get there we get home where I was, because obviously I couldn't follow the directions that I had been given because I did and got to the wrong place. So what's the likelihood that I'd follow them back and get to the right place? Very, very low. So that rugged, individualistic, uh, mountain man, adventurous thing, that wasn't me. Like I, I, I figured out if I lived on Gilligan's Island, I would have died. <laughs> Even with all of the professor's help. That dude was, I mean, it's amazing what he could do with a coconut. Right, right. But sometimes we, we, we get in this idea of, of being this rugged, individualistic, super strong, able to do whatever we need to do by ourselves, individual. And in our country, we value that 
We like the idea of a self-made man, somebody that pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps and, and accelerated and, and, and grew and did this all. The, here's the thing. This idea of rugged individualism, it's not a biblical concept. The Bible in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for the labors. If either one of them falls down, one can help the other up. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. You know, when we, when we live together and when we work together, it provides a strength beyond what we could do individually. How many of you like to think of yourself, now you don't have to raise your hand, as being totally self-sufficient, of being totally capable and able to do it. And I'll, I'll guarantee you that you probably do because you've never stopped to ask for directions. You get lost, we're going to keep on going. I'm not sure where we're going, but we're making good time. We like to think of ourselves as totally self-sufficient. And while it's a noble desire, true independence is an illusion. We need each other. I actually, I say this quite a bit. Christianity is not an individual activity. It's a team sport. But too many people will try and live it as an individual thing. Now, Galatians 6 does give us... Um, some guidance. It says, you know, each person should carry their own burdens, but it also tells for those that are spiritual to restore somebody caught in sin gently. What's it say? It says that we are to help one another. And as I was thinking about church and I was thinking about life and thinking about how I have grown up, there were three aspects of church that I really, really love. Now, I love so much about the church, but, you know, the first week that we were talking about, we, we, we talked about being a disciple. We talked about discipleship. Last week, we talked about what true worship is. This week, I want to talk about relationships, fellowship, and ownership. You know, growing up in the church, as I have, um, most of my best friends are from some church experience, some church activity. My best friend, Jay, uh, lives in, he lives in Ohio still. Um, I met him at church. Um, every, every, every girl that I've ever dated, I met at church or a church, or maybe not my home church, but uh, met at church. Every, every deep relationship. The most influential mentors in my life, the most influential individuals that have built, laid foundations in my life are from church. Why does that matter? Because my foundation is built on the lessons and deposits that came through those relationships. That's why I love the picnic last week so much. It kind of reminds you of an old church potluck, right? Did you ever did you grow up going to potlucks, church potlucks? Yeah, yeah. Um, my my senior pastor, Pastor Ross, that I grew up under, he um, here's what he would say every time we had a church potluck. He goes, "Well, if you can't cook anything, just swing by and grab a bucket of chicken." Every potluck that we had. We had like three dozen buckets of chicken. It was, it was amazing. We had chicken coming out wazoo. It was amazing, right? And so, and if you, if you watched our picnic last week, I could tell you where we would excel as a church, okay? So we had plenty of drinks. That was, that was good. You guys did a good job. The sides, we were a little light on the sides, but the desserts, I told you, you guys are sweet, and clearly, it's because of the desserts. But listen, the, the, you grow up going to those church pick, those potlucks, and this, you, you know what was so fun about the potlucks? It wasn't the setup. It wasn't the quality of the chicken or the food, um, although it was always a great opportunity growing up to uh, get one of Bourdain Fuller's pies. She made amazing pies. Uh, but it was, it was the opportunity to sit and talk. You know, Heather, Heather will tell you, uh, so when we, go to, when we go to potlucks or picnics or whatever at the church, uh, she likes to sit and talk to one or two people. That's what she, I, I, I just, I bounce around. I talk to everyone. I want to talk to everyone. So last week at the picnic, I never sat down. 
I never sat down. I walked around and talked the whole time. Why? Because I love talking to people. And I love that opportunity. And that's where I love the church. This idea of the, the rugged individual, kind of the, the, the mountain man, right? I mean, he's, uh, that looks like it's an AI-generated image because uh, that, that person can't really exist, I don't think. But that, that mustache and beard's epic. There's that cultural pressure of self-sufficiency. And there's pride that comes with it, that rugged individual. So we get that mindset, I don't need any help. I can change my own oil, build my own furniture, perform my own dental work. Just call me MacGyver. Or this one, have you ever heard, I've, heard, I've actually heard somebody say this, I'm a lone wolf. I don't know that wolves have a nice life. I'm an island unto myself. I'm a solitary warrior. Don't even try to get close to me because if I talk to you, I might actually have to be vulnerable. One of the things that we need to recognize is that our ability to rely on other people, it's a sign of wisdom, not weakness. Have you ever tried to have a back and forth conversation with yourself? How's it going? Going good? Great, thanks for asking. Listen, every, every argument I have with myself, I both win and lose. We can't do it by ourselves. Have you ever tried to give yourself a high five? It just looks weird. Good job, me. No. The other challenge of isolation is the depression and anxiety that it creates. Because what you start doing is you start thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to take care of this? And before long, we find ourselves feeling like Elijah. I'm the only one left, God. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, Elijah says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life away. Because he felt isolated and alone. You know, part of the reason we're doing Friends Day, and, I'll, and just as a reminder, next Sunday uh, we'll have about 9.30, we've got donuts and coffee. Um, and we're also doing the name tags again, okay? And so uh, if you don't like your normal name, you can make one up, they won't know. But uh, w- when you come in next week, we'll have tables out in the foyer with name tags, and uh, you write your name on there, and uh, please participate, it helps us. We want to we be a friendly church. We want, I want people to feel welcome. I want people to feel invited next Sunday. So make sure that you get here early and make sure that you, uh, you join in because it's going to be a wonderful time. It's going to be fun. Uh, if, if we look at what Scripture says, it shows us how we're supposed to live. Acts 2.42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. But if we walk in light, 1 John 1 7, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. Relationships begin just by reaching out. You know, there's probably somebody within this building, within this sanctuary, that you've seen for many, many weeks, maybe, maybe months, maybe even years. And if you were to see them out in public, you say, yeah, it's my friend from church. Now, you might not know their name because you have a, a real cursory, light relationship. You just recognize themselves as, that's a Calvary Lighthouse person. I, I, I identify them. Where, you know, and I, Typically, if I'm out someplace and somebody says hi to me and I don't recognize them, I will assume that they've come to church at some point. And so I just, especially, I, I've had it happen. Hi, pastor. Hey, how are you? It's always... It always behooves you to be nice everywhere you go, right? Because you never know when you're going to end up at church and that person that you were just mean to at the grocery store sitting next to you. But that's the beginning of relationship is recognizing that you as an individual were not called to live this life by yourself. That's why we invite you to give prayer requests every single week because you are not intended to live this life alone. You don't have to carry this burden by yourself. That's what Galatians 6, too. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Fellowship, fellowship is where we grow in our relationship. So before service, well, I want you to come early. Why? Because we want to give you coffee? No. We do want to give you coffee. 
but I want you to build relationships. Why was the picnic so important last week to me? Because it gives opportunity for you to sit and get to know each other. Because as you build relationships through fellowship, you are strengthened. You remember that verse, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. But if we come to church, do our duty, and leave without ever talking to anybody, we've missed the entire point of being together. Now, I'm so thankful that we have the ability to stream online. I'm thankful for those that are able to take, need to take advantage of it. But uh, the online experience does not replace the in-person experience. And I understand that there's times that are medical issues, that people can't make it, that, that it's challenging, you're out of town or something. But the relationship and fellowship that comes from being together is so very important. It's really why, uh, like, I love the picnic, and, and just so you know, too, in December, wow, this is way ahead, in December, we're doing the grand Christmas celebration again. You know, we did it two years ago. We didn't do it last year because of Heather's uh, cancer diagnosis, and she's so essential to that. We're doing it again this year. It's a catered lunch after, Christmas, after, after service. I think we decide December 15th, but it's going to be a fun time. Why do we do that? Because we want you to be in relationship. Why is women's ministry so important? Because I want you to build relationships within the church. Why is men's ministry a need? Because you need relationships within the church. Why are small groups so important? Because you need discipleship and relationship. Why do I encourage you to serve in ministry? Because most of the relationships that you build will be developed by the people you serve with. It's all intended to get you relating to one another. Because this, this right here, we, we've been talking about these three, but this here, when your life centers around Jesus. Now, do we exclude those that don't know Jesus? Absolutely not. We should have relationships with those that don't know Jesus because we want them to know Jesus. But when everything centers around Jesus here, our relationships, our friendships, what it allows us to do is to strengthen our lives and not feel as though we are out isolated by ourselves. One of the worst feelings that you can have is the feeling of hopelessness that comes from being alone. Well, pastor, I don't want to burden other people. Well, that's what friends do. I'm not saying that if you're my friend, you're a burden. But what, what I'm saying is we as friends help one another. There's been so many people over this last year as we've been walking through this cancer journey with Heather, they've said, well, we, I just didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put that on you. Now listen, we've had hundreds of people that have supported us. And we're so thankful for every text, every phone call, every email, every Facebook message that says we're praying for you. That's why we're so transparent about it. I mean, we, 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 we have shared every single step along the way, haven't we? And it's not because people have the right to know. It's because I want everybody that can pray to pray. I want people to support and encourage us. Listen, we've had, we've had literally thousands of dollars donated to support us. We, had, we, 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 we went like a month without having to do anything for food because we had so many meals that were coming to us. Some of them, we still don't know who they came from. That doesn't happen if we keep the burden to ourselves. The number of times that we, we find out that somebody's walking through a difficulty or a hardship and they say, well, I, I didn't want to trouble you with it. Jesus didn't call you to carry it by yourself. We're designed to be in community. We're intended to be in relationship. What did God say in the Garden of Eden? It's not good that man would be alone. In modern, it's just as true because we can't survive, even if we try, off of just pizza. And I would if it was just me. It's not good that we'd be alone. When we come together in community, we find that mutual encouragement we find the spiritual growth of iron sharpening iron. We share burdens and we share joys. We find a greater sense of purpose and meaning. Think about this. Think about a single thread, right? There's that, that's not that impressive. 
But when you put it together with thousands of other threads, you end up with this beautiful tapestry. Change slides. <laughs> there we go. I thought that was pretty leading, but it's okay. Right. You end up with a beautiful tapestry. You can't get that from one thread, can you? Think about going to, the, going to listen to music. A single violin could be wonderful, but a full orchestra is how you get the Star Wars theme song. <laughs> Keep that in mind. The blessings of community. That Ecclesiastes 4, 9 is so good. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. When we look at the uh, Acts chapter 2, which we've looked at so much, that whole paragraph, the whole chapter of Acts chapter, chapter 2, there's a, they, they talk about being all together in one place. They were together. And if we go into the New Testament, there's a series of statements about one another. Here's what, it, I, I just, I'm, I've got 14, and so stick with me here. Here's, here we go, you ready? Love one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Live in harmony with one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Serve one another in love. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive one another. Encourage one another. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Confess your sins to one another. Offer hospitality to one another without Grumbling. The, the one another commands establishes a biblical expectation of mutual care, support, accountability, and responsibility within our church community. But you can't do that if you don't know one another. They reflect the calling of believers to live out our faith in an interdependent relationship with fellow members of the body of Christ. And out of fellowship, or out of relationship, comes fellowship, and out of fellowship comes ownership. The, the Bible tells us so very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So we, in Romans 12, 5, though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. My, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, and I know lots of people, is Charlie Dove. Char I've talked about Charlie. Jeff Dove's one of our missionaries that we support. Charlie is 93 now. Charlie was the maintenance, like the ma not, I want to say maintenance guy at my home church, but he wasn't paid. He was just a volunteer. But he was there almost every single day fixing something. Why? Because he had taken ownership of making sure that that building was cared for. It's kind of like, I, I, I like to highlight our, our grounds crew. And you guys, many of you have never had the, uh, the joy of meeting him. But Bill Lloyd, uh, he, he, le he, let, he, he led our ground crew from 1984 until 2000 when he passed away. And now Tom Hicks, Tom's doing a wonderful job, but he, he, Tom really takes ownership of being here. He fixes the machines, and we, we've got a crew that, that work with him. We always could use more individuals. Listen, if you want to mow the, mow the yard at 30 miles an hour, it's a lot of fun. And so talk to Tom or talk to Persis. We'll get you involved. But why does, what, what causes somebody to show up and serve in children's ministry every week? Obligation? No. They've taken ownership of it. Not in a negative way that they have to control it, but they feel the responsibility. What causes Tom to be here, I don't know, three or four days a week? We're not paying him. He's taking ownership. What causes somebody like Adrian to serve, a high-capacity individual, to serve for 25 years? Now, we are paying her, but it's also, she's taken ownership of loving the ministry of this church. We have a role within the community. We have a responsibility 
to participate. We're one body. And here's the thing. Everyone is a 10 somewhere. You might not be able to sing on the worship team. You might not be able to preach. You might not be able to lead a kid's class. Maybe teenagers scare you. But you could help us make coffee. You could stand at the front door and say hi. You stand at the front door and say goodbye. I bet you you could even work a leaf blower. They're not hard. The pressure washer is fun. It's a, it's a messy job. We all have a responsibility. But we have to feel that, that ownership. Calvary Lighthouse is not just the pastors. Calvary Lighthouse is all of you. This building does not belong to me. The church does not belong to me. Obviously, it's a God's. But this building belongs to you as a member. I cannot just sell it and make off with the money. I need your approval to sell it, and you probably wouldn't give me all the money. The church is the people. You remember that, that little, I can't do the finger thing. This is a church, this is a steeple. You know, open the doors and hear all the people. And you feel, I got a weird finger, it doesn't work. And so, this is relationship, fellowship, ownership. 1 Peter 4.10 tells us, as each has a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You have a talent somewhere. You have a gift. Now think of a talent in the biblical sense of something of value. You have a talent. You have something to contribute to this body. And that's why you're part of it. You're not just here to receive. We're here to give as well. We all support the work of the church. We support it with our tithes and our offering. But we also support it with our bodies as part of the body of Christ. In the New Testament, you see it's presented as the unified body of believers. And I want, I want to go through this uh, relatively quick. So this is a time when you have to listen fast. And so I've got... Six reasons. Well, we already talked about this one, but the first one here is the church is the body of Christ. Time and time again, the, bo- the church is called the body of Christ. And as members of this body, believers are called to function together as interdependent part, each contributing their unique gifts and talents for the overall health and mission of the church. If a body is just laying on the ground immobile, what do we do? We call a doctor because there's something wrong. We're active, we're living, we're vibrant. The, the, the second thing that I want us to remember, according to 1 Peter 2, 5 and 2, 9, all believers are considered to be a royal priesthood and a holy nation. It is the priesthood of all believers. doesn't mean that everyone's called to be a pastor, but everyone's called to ministry. It means the responsibility for the ministry is not limited to professional clergy. Each member of the body has a God-given role to play. 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 talks about spiritual gifts. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit distributes various gifts to all believers, and these gifts are given from 1 Corinthians 12, 7, for the common good. When I was a teenager, I had the opportunity, I spent some time hanging out with, uh, and if you, any big Elvis fans in the room? Are we getting, is it, okay, all right, we, we got one, I see. All right, that's, oh, two, we got two, all right, okay. all right, listen, Elvis Presley had a stepbrother. Do you know his stepbrother's name? Dave Stanley. Dave Stanley, his, and so Dave Stanley was a traveling youth evangelist, and so I had the opportunity to hang out with Dave Stanley, and so if you were to, he actually has a Vegas show going on right now, talk, one, talking, called One of the Boys, and so, he's not that entertaining, but Dave was a traveling youth evangelist. But he got tired of working with the church because he felt like he wasn't getting paid enough money. He felt like churches would short him on offerings and stuff. So he decided to become a motivational speaker outside the church. And you know what he found out? Is that his gift and ability to speak was a gift from God, not a natural talent. And when he tried to use it outside the church, he could not do it. God gives us gifts for the common good of the body. 
God gives us gifts for the common good of the body. And then also, look at, look at the role of the pastors. Pastor Jesus, now, what is one of the roles of the pastor? Is it the pastor's role to do all the ministry? No, if you look at Ephesians 4, it says the role of the pastor is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. If we look at all the one another commands that we saw, love one another, share one another, care, it gives us a shared responsibility and accountability in scriptures. It implies a mutual responsibility. You are not your brother's keeper, but you should be your brother or sister's encourager, supporter. You should help. It is not their job to serve you. It is our job to serve one another. When all the members take ownership, the church is better able to fulfill its mission to make disciples and impact the world for Christ. One is too small a number for greatness. When we have a relationship that leads to fellowship, it leads to ownership because we are now not just a bunch of individuals within a room, but we are the body of Christ working together for the purpose of serving his kingdom and propelling the mission forward. This is something we can all grow in. You know, we've been talking about using this example of Jesus at the center. And what that means is that keeping Jesus at the center of my life should be my highest priority. Because I don't want to be over here where I'm a little wonky. And I don't want to be over here where I'm really wonky. I want to be not balanced. Balance is the wrong one. I want to be where Jesus is is the priority and the center of all that I do, of all that I am. That's the life of a disciple, is when Jesus is at the center. So it means we have to rearrange our lives. I I think I said it last week. If we think that we can serve Jesus and not change anything in our life, We are mistaken. One of the phrases that I believe God has has led us to is this one I've I've used it the last few weeks. Be disciples. Make disciples. Raise disciples. The raise disciples, I think that's pretty evident. I've talked about it quite a bit. That's the emphasis on the next gen, on, on children and youth, on middle school. This generation faces some incredible hardships. This generation faces some incredible challenges. When I was a children's pastor many years ago, uh, we, we really equated children's ministry of the early 2000s to youth ministry of the 80s. So what the youth used to face in the 80s is what they were facing, the children were facing in the early 2000s. Now what you're looking at is the children of today are facing the issues that Adults faced in the early 2000s. They're having to deal with uh, a world that is openly opposed to Jesus Christ. They're having to deal with open opposition in, in television, in media, online, social media, all of these things absolutely openly opposed to the message of Jesus They need prayer. They need support. They need strength. We need to intentionally raise disciples. But the other two, be disciples, make disciples. That make disciples one. What is that? You need to be sharing with other people what Jesus has done in your life and inviting them on the journey with you. Why? Because we are living in a world that is lost and dying. I saw something this morning um, from Richard Dresselhaus. Richard Dresselhaus. I don't know, how old is Pastor? He's got to be 900, right? So, yeah, Pastor, Pastor Dresselhaus, um, he actually did my, my mother-in-law's and father-in-law's wedding in 1977. He was the pastor of San Diego First Assembly of God. This is what he wrote this morning. It's time to build walls to prevent the invasion of the church by the ungodly values of an evil culture. It's reminiscent of the work of Nehemiah who returned to Jerusalem to rebuild its wall. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Why did the wall need to be rebuilt? To protect and define the parameters of the city. So what is the wall the church must rebuild? Authority. Rightly interpreting the word of God. 
holiness, a spirit-filled life separated unto the Lord and from the world. Divine presence, a recognition of God's glory and power, but tear down every wall that prevents the church from bringing the gospel to a lost and dying world. One of the things that we'll talk about more next week and one of the things I want to encourage you in, um, the life of a disciple is one that follows after Jesus. And next week I'm talking about specifically what does it look like to be a disciple. And then following that, we're going to jump into the book of Romans. We're going to be in Romans for quite a while because Romans is a foundational book. But next week and the weeks following after that, I've got a, a book that we're going to give out. It's not done yet, so you can't look at it. It's called the 90-Day Discipleship Challenge. We pick six things that we as a staff discussed and where I felt God really led us to. To encourage us to live as disciples. Bible reading plan in here, there's other things. Am I saying that this is going to make you a better Christian? Is this going to make you a better person? Is this going to make you more loved by God? No, but I promise you this. If you do an intentional effort to be a disciple, I can promise you that your relationship with Jesus will grow. I can promise you that God is faithful. And that as you grow in your intimacy with Jesus, all your problems will not go away. But your strength will be found in him. I think of that old hymn, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. So we're going to start doing that next week. We talk about the disciples. Why is it so important? I shared, you know, the, the, what Brother Dresselhouse shared was fantastic. This week, I don't know if you saw it, and we talked about it in the spring, um, Plumstead, Plumstead, New Jersey. Last week at a city council meeting, they invited a chaplain to pray, and he concluded his prayer with, Hail Satan, because in Plumstead, there is a satanic temple. Now, they say, we don't really worship Satan, but he's a, he's a wonderful literary figure that has many qualities that reject authority that we don't worship him, but he's a great example to follow. I got to tell you this, if you're elevating Satan because he's got qualities you want to emulate and using him as the example, that's called worship. But if the devil can convince you he's not real, then you can think of him just as a literary character. Like he's, he's you know, he, he's Huck Finn, right? He's Arthur from Lancelot. He's got qualities that would, but here's the thing. Spiritual warfare is real. We as Christians, guys, this is not a light burden. We should be so serious about our relationship with Jesus because the world that we're in is so serious about not following Jesus. John Donne was an uh, English poet. He was a cleric in the late uh, English Renaissance. He wrote a poem. You're probably familiar with it. You might not realize it. It says, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory, uh, as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thy own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sinned to Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We're created for community. We're created for relationship and fellowship. We're created for an interdependence upon one another. It's not rugged individualism that makes you strong. It's your ability to walk hand in hand with those around you. 
Step out of your comfort zone. Say hi to somebody you've never said hi to. Be vulnerable. Invest in meaningful relationships with fellow believers. Are you the kind of person who brings a dish to the potluck or the kind who just shows up hungry? When was the last time you reached out to encourage a fellow believer who you knew was going through a hard time? No one is meant to go through this life alone. Isolation has devastating consequences. We all have a responsibility to participate and support our community. So Pastor Spencer, I'm so busy. Then we need to rearrange our lives around Jesus. I don't have time to pray every day. Then we need to rearrange our lives around Jesus. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to come. Then we need to rearrange our lives around Jesus. Because whatever pushes Jesus out of the center is what we have decided we are going to worship. Jesus at the center. That's the life of a disciple. Don't be an island. Be a part of the community. Be a part of the body. Reach out to someone who's lonely. Use your gift to serve others. Because when we do life together, we reflect the heart of Jesus who created us for a relationship. Jesus, this morning, I pray that you would challenge us to draw close to you. I pray that you would challenge us to serve you, to be in relationship to one another, to love one another, to encourage one another, to be the body of Christ. Committed to your mission, for your purpose. So Jesus, draw us closer to you and to make you the center of our lives. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me? Just before I pray a prayer blessing, I want to invite our friends from the prayer team to come down. If you need prayer this morning for whatever it might be, maybe it's something I spoke about today, maybe it's something the Holy Spirit was just speaking to you, maybe it's something you brought in with you today, the team would love to pray with you. Don't leave here without being prayed for. Let me encourage you. Congratulate Pastor Jesus. Stop by the table out in the foyer, learn a little bit more about what's going on. Be here next week. Friends Day, be a friend. Be a friend. Even if you don't have somebody that comes with you, you could be a friend to somebody that is new. Get here early. You're at 9.30. Don't scare me about whether you're coming or not. Be here. Be excited. Be part of the community. Love people. Love people. I'm going to pray a prayer. And when I say amen, if you need prayer this morning, my friends from the prayer team would love to pray for you. And so when I say amen this morning, if you need prayer, please come down. Otherwise, we're so thankful that you're here this morning. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday. It's going to be a great day. Lift your hands to heaven. Don't forget that the ushers have the invite cards at the doors. Lift your hands to heaven. Let me bless you. Father, this morning, I pray you bless your people. Bless them in their coming and their going. Bless them in their homes and in their workplaces. Bless them with the desire and the heart of a disciple that pursues you in all things and puts you at the center of their life. Father, I pray you bless us with opportunities to share your love and your goodness and declare your glory in all things. Father, I pray you bless your people with an overwhelming sense of your presence and the authority and power that comes from your Holy Spirit. I pray you bless them as they go from this place and that they would be a blessing as they come. Father, I pray you bless your people through this week. Give them strength and encouragement. Give them hope in the glory of who you are. Be with us as we go.